Hello everyone, welcome back. We would like to welcome our next guest here in the Batcave. Uh, we have the pleasure to welcome Kenneth. Kenneth, welcome to the Thank Developers you. Conference here in Mauritius or being worldwide and uh, virtual. Um, if I understand correctly, you are residing in Denmark? Yeah, Am I right? That's correct. Copenhagen area, yeah. Fantastic. And it seems that you have quite uh, an interesting position and um, professional background. So if you don't mind to introduce yourself a little bit and um, we take it from there then. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, my name is Kenneth Christensen. I work for Intel, uh, so it's a semiconductor, but uh, I'm a software engineer because today hardware is nothing without software enablement. So like more and more the optimization we're getting uh, the improvement in this world is based by software. It's basically like software first. Uh, so like uh, I'm assigned to work on the web platform, both from a strategic point of view and making sure it runs well on our hardware as, as well as we make it capable enough that it still exists uh, for the future going forward. Um, so my, my interest in the web is that's basically what got me interested in computers, uh, being mm -hmm. able to use like Mosaic and the Netscape and uh, meeting people with, uh, with the same interests online. Uh, and then like getting this interest in technology. And then like when I got the opportunity to actually work on the web, working on WebKit, that was like so exciting. Working with some of the people that I've been idealizing and, and then like actually going into standards and actually improving the web itself. So that's kind of my background. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm also seeing in your bio that you are an elected member of the W3C Technical Architect Group. Yeah, so that correct. sounds pretty amazing, actually being um, connected and, and uh, related to WC3. I mean, that's the consortium that drives and runs the internet, the future of the internet. Yeah. Um, how is that? Uh, it's uh, basically a, a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> I've been elected uh, twice, so this is my second term, uh, and we right. basically have like uh, three, uh, meet, we meet uh, like four times a week, but I meet in three times because of different time zones. So mm -hmm. we're having two breakout calls uh, where we discuss like new upcoming uh, specification and features, get feedback, it's called like kind of a wide review. And then we have a plenary session where everyone gets together. It's normally at yep. odd hours, like very early or very late. Uh, and that's like basically every week. Plus, of course, a lot of preparation. And actually, uh, very soon, we're going to have a whole week of, of uh, conference calls, like a virtual face-to-face, -face. just making sure that everything on the web is kind of aligned uh, so that developers don't get too confused and that it kind of makes sense in the direction we're heading. Fantastic. Nice. And yeah, Aditya? And that's a really cool thing that you did because that's the backbone of everything that we will be having the conference on. It's really awesome. Thank you. And speaking speaking of web, I think this is a great um, keyword to to bridge the gap and uh, to to go into your presentation on web components. So, Kenneth, what is it? What's the story about web components? What are you going to show us today? Oh, I'm, I'm going uh, to go a bit through like uh, history lane, uh, look about like how it started, uh, like what were some of the issues and and what is like the status today, uh, because I believe that web components will just become increasingly more popular and more important. Uh, a lot of people have been like a bit critical because it's really difficult to do something on the web and, and, and coming with a new solution. There's a lot of things to consider. There's a lot of like uh, where you can go wrong and getting that feedback and getting something in there and out in people's hands takes a long mm -hmm. time. But I think it's basically there today. A lot of people are adopting it now, uh, including uh, big companies. Of course, like Google is one of the founders, right? But even like Microsoft, SAP, Salesforce, everyone is, is adopting web components in some capacity uh, and having great success. So I think we'll just see more and more of that uh, going forward. So, so I All think right. it's, it's nice to know about the, some of the history and get people mm -hmm. to play around with it again and uh, because it will become more and more important. So with that said, Great. I think I'll perfect. Yes, uh, as they said, my name is Kenneth and I will be your presenter today. And I work at this company called Intel. So I, I, I work on uh, standardizations in W3C, but I also work on, uh, on process implementation, especially uh, in, on Chromium. So that is the engine behind uh, the Chrome browser and the Edge browser at this point. 
Before this, we used to work on WebKit, which was then at that point used by both uh, Chromium, like Chrome, and as well as uh, Safari. So let's talk about uh, web components. So when people build uh, UI elements, they often think in terms of objects or components. Uh, because that kind of helps you conceptualize what you're doing, it also improves encapsulation as well as reusability. So if you build a component, you, it's kind of nice like a button. You don't need to build it every time you need to use a button. You can kind of like reuse it across your website, or even across multiple websites. But when the web was designed uh, more than 25 years ago, it was designed for documents, uh, basically getting text online and linking to different sites. So like a lot of things have changed since then. Um, and a lot of people say like, well, there's all these nice elements in the web browser itself. They might not be exactly what I need, but they kind of have access to all these things that I don't have access to. So it's kind of like the engine itself and the web is sometimes a kind of black box. So it would be nice to expose some of that. For instance, it has been very difficult to implement something like the video element, uh, which works really nice. Internally, it's actually built up using the DOM, just like, like you would build a website. So why can't people do that themselves? Um, so people try to figure out solutions because people really wanted to build these web experiences, especially after seeing things like Gmail and Google Maps, uh, Outlook, et cetera, coming to the web and offering these web, uh, like app-like experiences. So pe people created frameworks uh, offering convenience, reusable components, and as well as easy way to create these components. Um, but they're not always like great and flexible. Uh, like I remember like playing around with jQuery UI and I found it super inflexible at that point uh, when I was working at Nokia. But like things has gotten better and better over time. Unfortunately at a cost because as you have to implement a lot of things that's already in the browser, uh, that is a lot of code. And that also meant that maybe in, before this, like today, the browsers are, are faster, the computers are faster, the phones are faster, so we can actually ra run that a big amounts of code. Uh, but it still needs to be downloaded, right? It also means that every time uh, as a browser engineer, I go and make an optimization um, that might not be used at all because these frameworks, they implement the same framework as the browser. So. Frameworks require you to ship a lot of JavaScript code. And one thing that's very important to know is that every byte is not equal on the web. Downloading an image, say 100 kilobytes of an image, is pretty fine. It's pretty quickly for a browser to actually take that and render it on screen. But with JavaScript, 100 kilobytes of JavaScript is much more expensive. There's a nice article about uh, from uh, Adios Osmani. It's called The Cost of JavaScript, which I really encourage you to check out. So the thing with fast uh, JavaScript is that it needs to be fast at downloading. So it needs to be small, but it also needs to be passed, and that also takes time. Then it needs to be compiled or just in time compiled and it needs to be executed. All of this takes time and makes JavaScript quite expensive. But new efforts arrived. Uh, people came up with this thing called the Extendable Web Manifesto. Basically kind of decided that when we're working on, on specs and the standards, we should look at trying to to explain how the web is working today in the browser, in the engine, instead of just like building something on top. So that people had the same abilities as the browser to implement things. So the idea was that why shouldn't we create like a low level API that frameworks and library can build on top of and basically try to explain the black box that is the browser. So this was the idea of web components. So uh, at Google, they brought together a team uh, that thought about how developers could create their own like platform native elements. Something like the video element, why shouldn't you be able to create that yourself? In the browser, we, it was implemented using something internally called Shadow DOM. So the idea was, could we expose this Shadow DOM to the web developers as well? So uh, for uh, spec specification proposal were made, uh, the template element, the custom elements, Shadow DOM, and the now dead HTML imports. And it kind of worked okay. So in order to really make sure that this was the right approach and getting this in developers' hands, um, uh, some people from the NEO team, like I think like half of the team uh, working on WebOS, they actually joined Google and they created this new product called Polymer. So the Polymer team's idea was to, to create some polyfills so you could play around with these features without it actually being in the browser. And then actually getting a lot of feedback that could feed back into the standards. 
But like any major feature, some mistakes were made. The specs became very, very complex. Actually, people in the team working on these specifications, they went around and asked all different kinds of teams inside of Google, uh, like, what do you need to create the perfect thing? Like, and if you ask developers what they want, they want everything. So they ended up becoming very, very complex, thus meaning it was really difficult to polyfill, and the polyfills uh, became very big and very slow. I also think that it took a bit of overhead, like the Polymer team tried to play around with, well, maybe we should make an element for everything, like even like connecting to Bluetooth devices, which I don't think makes a whole lot of sense. And they've later abandoned that idea. They also found out that actually they created also an element collection uh, called paper elements and iron elements, et cetera. And just to maintain this, that took a lot of resources for a small team. Like you can imagine if something like YouTube adopt these elements, you need to maintain them because those sites need to be running all the time. Also, other browser vendors were kind of negative for like, this is a major feature. This is really complex and really hard to implement in the browser and then to make it efficient. So actually when uh, Google decided to branch off of Fork WebKit and create Blink, uh, the WebKit product removed all of the web components code. But then luckily things changed. Apple got really interested in web components again and proposed a simplified version. Uh, we also got uh, ECMAScript 2015, also known as ECMAScript 6. So we got classes like JavaScript became a much better. And with Apple's changes, the shadow DOM spec became much simplified. No longer they were inherited into multiple uh, shadow rules. Also custom elements got redesigned in the new world of ECMAScript 6 classes. And an HTML import basically got put on hold because people were working on ECMAScript modules and ideas around that. This uh, got to be known as Web Components version one and the old kind of Google proprietor version got rebranded as V0 and has now been removed from, from Chrome itself. So both Chrome and Safari, they actually implemented this version one. The Polymer team updated their implementation, Polymer two, and a few other web component frameworks started to see the light. But then things got even better. Uh, Mozilla got very interested in implementing the whole browser UI using web components. So they implemented ship web components as well. Uh, the whole like template thing already got very early on, got in, uh, added to the HTML spec. But custom element and shadow DOM then landed in the DOM spec itself. So it's actually part of the whole dominates HTML specs. So it's not something like it's a separate spec any longer. Then we also had the very uh, a company called Ionic, a very popular, uh, they provide some kind of elements and components that people could use for building uh, like web apps, especially hybrid apps that people would put into the app store. So they decided, uh, like they, it was all based on Angular, but they decided to base it on web components uh, so that it worked in Angular and React and Vue and and they had a lot of success doing so. Then you also saw big companies as Salesforce and SAP creating web components element, even like Adobe. Um, one of the things that really held down web components was Microsoft's Edge, because it, like Microsoft was way behind. They really said that they had to do a lot of refactorings inside of Edge actually to be able to implement web components. But Microsoft has since then uh, moved away from Edge HTML uh, to use Chromium as well. And by that, they got web component support for free. When they did so, Microsoft started working on, on extension to, uh, to web components, such as HTML module, uh, something that hasn't shipped yet, but is a long-term plan uh, to get into the platform. Microsoft also created something called OpenUI, kind of like a, a website or like community where they're trying to look at different element systems and try to figure out whether you can make some standardized new elements that eventually can end up in HTML be extendable by uh, the web components uh, specifications uh, and have like really good theming. Microsoft also recently uh, launched something called Fast, which is their like new components that all based on web components. So you're seeing more and more companies are adopting it. Also, uh, Google have like the material web components uh, as web components as well. So with that said, uh, and with the old edge out of the question and the new edge based on, on the same base as Chrome, you basically have support for web components everywhere today. So you might be wondering, what is the advantage of using web components? 
First of all, I think it's very important that this is a standard because the standard in browser means that it's going to stay there for now until the end, basically. Like, this is something that if you invest in this, it's not going, going away from one day to the other. Uh, like, maybe if you invest in a, if you invested in jQuery UI, maybe you find out that at some point, like, it's not being maintained any longer, and you have to, like, move away from it or maintain it yourself. Also, like, browser optimizations, uh, we can make optimizations inside the browser, and that's just going to improve performance of everyone using web components. One example of this was, like, constructible style sheets. It will also play nicely with other browser features as web packaging, CSS, et cetera. And this is also one of the things that we care a lot about in the W3C Technical Architecture Group. It also provides uh, proper CSS scoping. And as you don't have to download this framework because it's shipped with the browser, uh, it's, it's really fast. Uh, so you can create like websites that are super fast by using web components. So here's one example of uh, Adam Bradley from Ionic uh, he adopted, with very little changes, he adopted uh, constructible style sheets in Ionic and just got like pretty good uh, performance improvements. And I think that's really, really nice. So let's uh, have a, a bit of a look at how all of these web components actually work. So there are a lot of different features. Uh, there's uh, custom elements, shadow DOM, template, and newer specifications such as shadow parts, custom CSS properties, and constructible style sheets. So let's look at that. So uh, this is how the DOM used to look uh, for a lot of people without web components. You got this thing kind of called div soup uh, because the frameworks did, did everything and like reading this uh, code, like the view source was very popular in the old days. It's kind of useless uh, in this sense. So we often think in components. So if you look at this very nice site by my friend Sherry, uh, you see that she marked areas of how she would uh, construct such a website in components. Sidebar, you have these cards, you have menu items, and you have a search bar. So common developer requests would be some way to do computationization to encapsulate uh, styling and styles so that you don't import a styling and suddenly change its colors elsewhere. It would be nice to still be able to use view source. And we want to share these elements across teams and frameworks, as well as having something that's easy to understand, even by designers, as well as being small and fast, so you can create really fast and engaging experiences. Web components solve a lot of these uh, requirements, such as CSS and calculation using Shadow DOM, easy debuggability by having something that's really close to the middle, um, and you can share these components across teams and frameworks without having to worry about styling and, and problem with integration. And there's also theming support coming via shadow parts, which is getting more and more implemented. So let's look at uh, some of these features like HTML uh, templates. So templates kind of allow you to create some fragments of markup, which is kind of passes HTML, but it's inert. This means that if you have JavaScript inside it and stuff like that, it's not going to be executed. Uh, the idea is that you can take this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, inert code and you can stamp it out. And the browser doesn't have to pass the HTML every time. So for instance, for this example you're seeing here for these cards, you could create something like this. So I'm just using a template. So this is not being rendered as shown on the screen. But what you do instead is that you get a you get a hold on this template, and then you kind of like you can you can change some of uh, how it is, some of like how what is the source, or so, some of the content of it. And then you can kind of like clone it and insert it into the DOM. So that's kind of what we have done here. And that is fast, fast basically, it's basically kind of an optimization for the browser, uh, so it doesn't have to redo that every time. So custom element that uh, allows you to create your own tags, HTML tags, or even exist, uh, extend from existing ones. There's a few like uh, lifecycle uh, calls. Uh, here I'm comparing them to common frameworks, like there's a constructor in, in the class, it's connected callback, disconnect an attribute change callback. So here's an example of an element in use. So you see uh, BB red strawberry. I'm, I'm even using two attributes like image and description, or imp and description, basically like to change how it should render. So the way I'm doing it is that I, I create a class that extends from HTML element. If I need to do anything in the constructor, I need to inherit from uh, 
Uh, I need to call super. That's very important because I'm in here extending from HTML element. When I'm done, I call this custom elements dot define where I give it a name, and I associate it with this uh, element class. What's important here is that all the names need to have a hyphen, like a dash inside them. This is so that when we create new elements in HTML, they will never have a dash in them, so there won't be any conflict. In the connector callback, this is when it's actually inserted into the DOM. Uh, one example here, I'm just like getting my template and I'm cloning it and inserting it. So that would be like a common way to do that. If you need to um, act on attributes, uh, like we use imp and description, you need to impl implement like uh, the static getter called observe attributes, which returns an array of the attributes that you care about. This kind of sets up like uh, so that every time these are changed, these change or when they are used the first time, it will uh, invoke the attribute change callback. In this example, I'm just like taking those attributes and, and adding them directly into my object itself. Like you can do whatever you want to do with them. So uh, looking at this example again, now you see now I get a BB red strawberry, and you see that the image thing gets used inside. Uh, of this, like um, of the template itself. So one of the problems that people have is that when you go and define some CSS, like here I'm setting uh, for a paragraph, I'm setting the color to red, it leaks. So you see, I want to set this inside my element, and suddenly it's leaking outside. So the paragraph outside of my element also got red. Not really what I was intending to do. Um, so Shadow DOM provides you some styling capsulation so that this doesn't happen. Happen. The way it works that uh, is that you create, you attach a shadow DOM. Uh, it has two modes: open or closed. If you have it open, then you can uh, you can call this dot shadow root and get access to it. If it's closed, you cannot. So you need to store it yourself because the attached shadow function also returns uh, the object itself. Most common is just to know use open. So here I'm. I'm I'm creating this shadow DOM, so instead of just adding things to my element as child elements, which is called often light DOM, I'm here adding it to my shadow root. So it's called like the shadow DOM. So as you see, I get hold of my template, I clone it, so I've got a new node, and I pin that to my shadow root. So, for instance, the, it could look like something like this. What is really interesting about uh, shadow DOM is that it has this new element inside it called slot. Uh, so slot is basically whatever, when I have an element called BB, red strawberry, and I put some children inside, uh, where should those element, where should those element go? Normally they will go to where you have an unnamed slot. You can also give them a name, like have you like the name title, name description, and you go to those specific places. So this means that when I'm instantiating or using my new element, BB, I actually have the ability to add these uh, slot children and what I have in there will be put into specific places inside of my shadow DOM. Very, very flexible. Um, if you do styling, you can just do that inside of your shadow root as well, and that will only be used in your shadow root and won't leak outside. What is interesting here is, is of course, that, uh, that you see the WAR, and you can use something called custom properties. Uh, I'll probably get back to that later. Uh, that still allows you to style something from the outside. So you see in this example, I am styling, I'm setting the dash dash, those are custom uh, CSS property. Uh, so I'm, I'm setting these uh, on this element and these will then propagate into uh, my local shadow DOM. So this means that if, if I'm setting the background here to white uh, as the color and the background color as red, you see that is applied to my card element. So, if we try again to set the color red uh, with the, the shadow DOM isolation, you see that uh, it it doesn't. Oh, I did that outside. It doesn't leak in, into my 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 DOM, my new shadow, my new custom elements here. So that's kind of like the summary. Uh, we looked a bit about templates. Uh, we looked at custom elements with uh, lifecycle hooks. We also looked at using shadow roots, using slots, which cannot be named, and we themed a little bit using CSS custom properties. 
But uh, there's also coming something called Shadow Parts. So this is definitely implemented in Chrome and also Edge. I believe uh, it is it's implemented in Safari, and I believe it is shipping with the next version of Safari. Um, so that should be within a couple of weeks or so, I'm hearing. Um, so this kind of allows you, because you can imagine if you have a, a custom element and it embeds other custom elements, like I'm doing a my dialogue and it contains two of my bottoms inside, uh, then I might want to like style my, my bottom. Uh, so instead of having to go in and, and, and like doing like special custom properties for all of these uh, thing, I can basically just like name these uh, elements inside it and that allows me to theme them directly. So this is what's called uh, shadow parts. So in this example, uh, you can see the span. I give it a name part. Text span is kind of like exp exporting that. And that means that from, uh, from uh, CSS, I can, uh, I can call the name of my, my element, and then I can do colon, colon, part, and the name of it, and then I can theme it directly. Um, so that's really nice. One of the other uh, things that uh, is really nice about uh, a new standard is called uh, constructible style sheets. So one of the issues you had with, uh, with any framework out there today, and even with uh, web components, is that every time uh, you're applying this, you're you're doing new CSS and it's gonna be duplicated for every element because it might be different. Uh, you might not ever change it, so all your buttons might look exactly the same, uh, but it means that the CSS is duplicated and kept in, in memory. The browser tries to be very smart in, in sharing the, the CSS memory, uh, but it's very, very tricky and very diff difficult to keep track of. Uh, so constructible style sheets allow you, the developer, to control that. So uh, here we have uh, one example where I'm creating a, a template uh, with some CSS. So the idea is that instead of doing this directly, uh, you create a CSS style sheet, and then you add all your CSS to it, and then you just adopt that by every uh, all of the components that needs to adopt it. So all your my buttons will use the same by default. So here's one example of how to do that. So here I'm creating a CSS style sheet, then I'm setting the, I'm calling uh, replace sync, which just sets the content. Uh, and after that, it, I can just, uh, I can like adopt it here. I'm adopting it to the root document. So it doesn't only work with uh, custom elements. It also work, works with the document itself. Um, and as you see below, I'm actually using it uh, and we're using a shadow root. Uh, so that is really, really a nice uh, thing. The other thing is that you can adopt more than one style sheet. Uh, you might be able to adopt multiply. So this allows people to create some kind of theming systems. One thing that's all that's new in uh, JavaScript, uh, it's uh, pretty new, it's called public and private class fields. So this is also coming to most browsers. I don't know the exact, I believe it's in uh, Chrome and, and Edge, but I believe it's also in Safari today. So this is a nice feature that allows you um, to create like fields and even private fields. So let's look at how this looked in, in ECMAScript 6. So you see I'm creating this underscore count. I have to do this in my constructor, uh, and then I can modify it. Using uh, these new class fields, I can create this outside uh, or just inside my class uh, and even instantiate it. So this is just a nice, especially people that, that use TypeScript will, have, will be used to using this. But the cool thing is that you can also make these private by adding the has sign in front of it. So if you do it this way, you cannot access them from the outside. As you see in this example, I create my new increasing counter. If I try to access them, like I'll get a syntax error. So this makes it possible for me to do something that is really private. Uh, you can even use it for methods. So you see here, like methods are not, you cannot call them from outside. And this is kind of like, like really interesting. So here's a, a, a another example that shows you like, like how you can really even like makes code much smaller. But the cool thing is we talked about uh, early before I mentioned that uh, shadow root could be open or closed. Uh, the big difference was if it's closed, you don't have access to this dot shadow root. So also no one from the outside can call and get access to your shadow root. 
Uh, but as Attach Shadow returns a shadow root, by using close, you can now uh, still get access to it by keeping it as a hidden or like a, uh, as a private property or a field, uh, as you see in this example. So I think this is kind of nice if, if you really care about this being uh, encapsulated. So summary, we have uh, today looked a bit about the history of web components and its complexity. Uh, web components are today part of the HTML and DOM specs. So these are not specific specs. This is a standard and they are widely available uh, and getting pretty good adoption, especially in the enterprise and for design systems. But there are still things that could be improved upon. Uh, so we have gotten shadow parts. It's, it's many places today. Constructible style sheets is uh, in Chrome, but uh, it's not in Safari yet. And there's even other things coming soon that will solve even more issues, such as CSS module, HTML module, scope registries, and even something called form participation that allows you to create elements that can participate in form submission. So you don't have to build all this kind of um, infrastructure around forms just to getting elements that can be submitted. So, so um, one of my own uh, preferred uh, libraries or mini libraries or micro framework as some say for creating web elements is called lit element. Uh, I was one of the first adopters uh, of something called lit HTML and I actually created uh, the first lit element class, uh, but then like Google did their own, that's very similar to mine afterward and I abandoned my own. So I just wanted to show this because Google is using this in all their material web components. And even Microsoft is using it for many projects such as the PeterRayBuilder.com. And even the Microsoft uh, let me graph, uh, toolkit. So you see here, they're also using lit element. So lit element is really nice because it's very, very small, very easy to use. And, it, and you don't need to deal with these things as creating a template tag yourself, uh, it's, it's kind of like a much nicer developer experience. Uh, it also makes sure that all the renders are, are updates in a batch. So kind of like the same advantage you have of using something like React. Um, it doesn't use a uh, virtual DOM, but in, instead uh, it, it knows exactly where you have these insertion points. So it's actually using less memory and it's actually faster. And like it's pretty small. It's like around 7K now, like compressed, and they're working on a new version that will be even smaller. So here's like, for instance, like small one small example of something I implemented. I did this grocery list example. Uh, so you see, I'm also using a, uh, this is done in TypeScript, so I'm I'm using some uh, decorators as well. So you see, I'm using a custom element decorator to say what should be the name of the item. I set styles directly using these new features of class fields, uh, and I'm setting up some properties. Whenever these properties uh, change, it will automatically trigger uh, a batched uh, re-render. So really, really simple uh, and a very nice uh, developer experience. It's also very similar to React, so you implement a, a render function where you return uh, this called an HTML tag string literal, uh, where you basically do all the HTML, and you have these insertion points where you can use JavaScript or refer to, um, to JavaScript properties. So very nice. And with that, I would like to say thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, feel free to hit me up on Twitter at Kenneth Road. And uh, I hope you've had a nice conference so far. Yeah, amazing, amazing, amazing. I mean, <clears throat> um, the, the, the situation about web components with the new features regarding scope and having the ability then to um, you know uh, declare functionalities properties as private I think this is going to help to get way more clarity and and flexibility and also uh, portability in, in your in your code so that you can actually easily reuse it and and have your components um, one of the questions that I that I would like to know is um, as you are saying, okay, you have the adaptation in Chrome, in Edge, Safari, and so on. Um, what's the situation for the mobile platform? That is the same for the mobile platform, basically. So, okay. Uh, so so uh, I, I think that's also why you see the adoption now. Like I think what was hindering uh, was the, the required use of polyfills. So mm -hmm. like, like, yeah, it's really nice, but uh, 
I really depend on on Edge, for instance, or a specific mobile browser, and like mm -hmm. having those polyfill and being like slowing down like the advance, like killing some of the advance of using web components, uh, was like keeping some people away from using web components. It is still an issue with the uh, IE eleven, uh, but uh, like like lit element, for instance, they have polyfill, so you can make it work on IE eleven mm -hmm. if you really have users. It's kind of the thing is like, okay, if they don't want to upgrade, well, they won't get the best experience, but they will get a working experience. Uh, but I think with Microsoft uh, having the new Edge that works for Windows 8.1, Windows 7, and Windows 10, like IE 11 is, is, is going to be gone soon. Even Microsoft announced that like, yes. like there are, Microsoft 365 will not use uh, or not support IE 11 from next year. So it's a time for people to just like forget about IE 11, I guess. Well, I mean, IE has been officially declared as, as um, out of life uh, by Microsoft yeah. themselves. So, so I mean, um, the major um, tracking point is that it is part of the operating system. As soon they, as soon as they get it out, if they would get it out there, um, it would be solved, uh, or it, it would be faster solved, and the adaptation uh, onto modern browsers that are supporting web components and other aspects uh, would be way, way quicker. But I mean, if you see some web statistics and uh, web server statistics, is that you still see people popping up with IE7, IE8. It's, it's just kind of, what are these people doing? <laughs> but I think like the nice thing is that like, like using lit element, for instance, you can support IE11 if, if, yeah. if you care about those users. Uh, they won't get the best experience, but like, hey, they're not getting the best experience anyway mm. because they're using i11. So, mm. uh, no, that's I very think, good. I think I that, mean, that's good to to keep in mind. Uh, yeah, but like, I think yeah. the, the the future looks pretty bright. There's a lot of uh, excitement and focus on fixing the remaining things uh, around web components to make it really, really good. Uh, I see that uh, Microsoft came up with this. As I mentioned openui.org where they're looking at all kinds of uh, existing uh, design system and frameworks and see mm -hmm. like, could we create like a, uh, let's say a common element, like a table that works the yep. same? Uh, yeah. what, what, what does people need for like theming uh, and, and features? And, and, and with that, they, they really want to, when they have the right solution, they want to turn that into a new element in the HTML spec. They're actually already doing that and as an experimental, I think a new select element uh, which they're proposing for Chromium. So that's kind of mm -hmm. the first element. What is interesting is that Greg, who kind of started and spearheaded this feature at Microsoft, actually left and joined Salesforce. So Salesforce is, is, is heavily invested in web components with their own Lightning web components. And, mm -hmm. and they're like now uh, working together with OpenUI. So you'll get that like Microsoft's fast elements and Salesforce elements will probably have the exact same properties and attributes and theming things in the future. And, and then like the next step is that these will just go into the browser itself uh, yeah. and look the same. And I think mm -hmm. that this is pretty exciting that we might actually end up with good elements in the browser itself. These will then be extendable using some of these technologies as the, uh, the shadow parts and the like of using web technologies, uh, like web components technologies, if you need to change them further. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you can say like, oh, let's abandon web components and wait until everything lands in the browser in five years. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, what is what is the current situation about um, available web components in regards to, to UI functionalities? I mean, um, a common uh, pain point from, from the past, I don't know how many years, is always about, you know, having uh, a proper or a, a, a quick um, UI element in the browser to actually uh, display uh, data in, in a grid format, um, to have proper um, localized uh, data select, uh, date time selections and, and things like that. So do you see that there is um, going to be a greater adaptation that there might be new components being introduced that are still kind of missing a little bit on, on the web platform? Yeah, definitely. That's also the point of web components is that you can mix and match, right? So mm. someone can create like a, a date widget uh, that is better than you have today. Like even like JavaScript now have like, is adding like new like temporal things and 
update time, so it's going to be better. And like that web components could solve like accessibility and whatnot. And, and like a lot of people are doing this. So a lot of companies yeah. that work on web components, they do try to make like a low level. So we have the ING bank. So they create like unthemed elements that you can just use and, and, and reuse and adopt. So that mm -hmm. is also the whole idea is that a lot of companies is gonna, sometimes they need their own web components because it's specific to the experience. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's more like generic. So they try to make this more generic. And that is when you got the open UI because an open UI will come in and try to, if, if they can see that like both what Salesforce is doing and SAP and Microsoft is very similar, maybe they could standardize that and then yep. implement that inside of like Chrome and get experience. And if it's good, eventually it should end up in HTML spec. That's that is like a dream. It's not going to be for everything, uh, but it's mm -hmm. going to be for the most common thing so that you will, you will get like accessibility by default, uh, good uh, localization by default, performance yeah. by default and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the good part is also that based on the fact that the functionality is then built in into the browser, um, having the reduced uh, amount of data that is that goes over the wire is definitely a, a big advantage in regards to the performance, uh, snappiness, responsiveness uh, of the components themselves because it's in the browser. You don't yeah. need to, you know, download it all the time. All right, that's but, great. But even, uh, even, even today, if you create, like I've created like a lot of experiences using web components and even like using something like the material web components, they are so tiny and they're fast. So mm -hmm. even th those are not built into the browser, but they're using a lot of infrastructure that's built into the browser instead of reinventing all of that in JavaScript. And that just yep. makes them kind of fast by default. Uh, so I, I've been using these and, and of course you only import the elements you need and mm -hmm. it's just, just been fast enough. You run like Lighthouse and like, yeah, it's good. <laughs> those work well. Uh, they have good accessibility. They, they use the, the, the right sized images and everything. And I'm like, okay, I don't need to do anything else. Uh, That's true. That's true. I mean, we had um, last year during the Google Dev Fest here in Mauritius, we had actually uh, GDE Mike Geyser uh, yeah. presenting about um, lighting up the web with lit. And it was super impressive about you know, what happened, what he showed, were capable to show some like 10 months ago. And yeah. uh, it's clearly, I think, the way to go to get uh, faster internet and also, you know, um, reducing the, the, the load on the networks itself. And um, especially then in regards to mobile devices that you will get a better experience because you, you simply um, can focus on, on the development. You don't need to worry about, you know, optimization for loading sequence and, all the kind of front end handling in, in order to get your your controls uh, probably displayed and, and activated but it's, also, it's also just like to finish off it's also going to be a requirement soon uh, yep. because like uh, the google team in collaboration with others went out and looked at metrics like mm. how do we make sure that the web is fast enough so people actually care about the web and doesn't like get yes yeah, loading too fast too slow so i'm just using a native app and they came up with what's called web vitals. So they're having like different uh, measurements that might yes. change over time. And, and these are being built into like Lighthouse so you can audit your yep. page and they will give you like grading. Uh, and the important thing is that the Google search uh, and maybe others will like look at these numbers when they're gonna rank you. So, so if you wanna get your experience out there and getting ranked nicely on Google, which is like this search engine of choice for many people, like you need to make a fast experience and web components is just gets you like really far in that respect. Uh, instead of having to some of the old uh, libraries, like they're so big and like they're trying also now to slim down, but in many mm -hmm. cases, really, really difficult uh, because like unless they, they deprecate a lot of the functionality and move to more adopting web components technology, they're just not yeah. gonna get there. All right, Aditya. Thank you. So, well, as for me, I don't have really have any questions because it's like my cup of tea to start. But it was right. it was really interesting to see that more more things were being built with the browser instead of loading things up and consuming more bandwidth. So, faster internet for everyone. Yeah. Um, just just one more thing to catch up or to to um, put some maybe put some light on it. Um, 
with the development of uh, web assembly, uh, BASM, um, how's, how do you see there the, the, I mean, it feels like it's kind of competition, different approach of technology, because literally with BASM, you can uh, get your own runtime environment, you get your own components, um, with the programming language that you are familiar with, not necessarily uh, being uh, bound or restricted of using uh, ECMAScript or, or JavaScript. So where where do you see this combination with web components and, and web assembly? Uh, I think a lot of people misunderstand uh, web assembly. Uh, first of all, uh, you need to compile it into a web assembly binary. Uh, yeah. So loading time is often not that good. So mm -hmm. it's not something you want to use for your UI components. Uh, okay. Like like you can imagine something like like Autodesk. So you want it to load fast and show the UI. Whether you then get the, the the editor view, that can take a few seconds or even like half a minute, like the first time for it to load. Mm -hmm. Because WebAssembly, like you still need to download a lot of binary data, and yep. and and it needs all of it before you can start to execute. There's some streaming going on, but but that's generally the pain. The other thing is that it's tied together with JavaScript. So if you have a function in, in WebAssembly and you want it to call it into the DOM, uh, well then first it needs to be there needs to be pulling some some wrapper code between JavaScript that yep. that kind of maps uh, the the DOM API to JavaScript to the WebAssembly API. So when you're calling a WebAssembly function, it's going to call JavaScript, it's going to call the DOM, it's going to call the JavaScript backend into the WebAssembly. So there's definitely a lot of overhead there. Uh, this kind of makes it so, yes, you can create a Rust implement, uh, language where you can create DOM, but it's not going to be fast because okay. there's a lot of overhead. There is so, work going on on yep. uh, by, uh, bypassing uh, some of this overhead by linking directly to what is called Web IDL. It means that you can directly from, from WebAssembly call the C++ implementation of the DOM APIs. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's still a way out. The next step, the next issue you get is that WebAssembly only supports uh, non-garbage collected languages. Uh, this means that you might say, well, you can run uh, Go in WebAssembly or even like .NET, yes, but then you take the whole runtime to .NET runtime or the Go runtime and compile that to JavaScript, to ECMAScript, no, to WebAssembly yeah. as well. So for Go, for instance, it's more than 30 megabytes. So okay. like, you're not gonna create a, like a very fast loading experience using Go. It's more like a yeah, proof but, of concept at this point. Yeah, but in this case, it's just a one-off because I mean, as soon as you come the second time to the to the website, it is cached in the browser. Yeah, you still Except need to it, load it. it you it, still it, need to load it into memory. You still need to run. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so but yeah. do you do you still then even that you let's say you're using WebAssembly because you say okay you will want to do like um, uh, input validation and things like that. Um, you still have the capability that you can actually um, use the combination of web components with right. functionality that comes from from WebAssembly. Right. Yeah, you can do that. Like like WebAssembly is really great for like bringing existing code and libraries to the web. Uh, something mm -hmm. like image decoders and whatnot is really great. Uh, yep. For like C and C++, people normally use mscripten because you can imagine if I have a C++ application that is drawing something to the screen. I'm probably using a library for that. I might be using sure. SDL. So what yeah, Emscripten yeah. does is that it converts SDL to, to uh, WebGL using the yeah. Canvas stack. It converts uh, common uh, audio libraries to web audio. So it also mm -hmm. provides a lot of like boilerplate code uh, that makes it nice for bringing existing things. So if you want just to write like a, uh, use WebAssembly to speed up a calculation, for instance, uh, yeah. then you probably don't want to use C and C++ because M script and provides all this extra boilerplate code that you don't want that will make it okay. slow and big. For this reason, mm -hmm. you might want to use Rust that has more a direct compiler, but it doesn't have access to all of these uh, uh, audio and, and the like. Um, yeah. Or you want to use something like a specific language as assembly script, which is kind of a, a version of TypeScript created for WebAssembly. 
Yeah, well, then you go really go down a little bit more to the, to the metal. Yeah, yeah. But on the other side, I mean, if I take something like uh, Unity into consideration uh, regarding then web development or game development in the web browser, because I mean, as far as I understand, is that Unity uses then kind of uh, a combination of the C plus plus and Mono environment yeah. to to bring you that kind of um, rich. Um, UI and, 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 and UX experience uh, in the web browser. And I mean, Mono runtime, it, it, come, it, it comes through the WebAssembly approach. And uh, well, I guess it have both, both technologies have their, their um, reasons and purpose uh, on, I think on the web. Kind of, I think it's kind of nice with like assembly as Unity because that's kind of like, it's not really a, a web thing. It's kind of like its own window. It's kind mm -hmm. of like a canvas or or like in the old Java days, you call it an applet. Uh, yes. So it kind of is isolated and works very well. Also, yeah. people are kind of used today that when in, in running a game, it kind mm -hmm. of there is some loading involved. You get like yeah. a, a nice screen and it will show you some background. Then you get some music and kind of people like, yeah, I'm going to play a game and I'm going to play for an hour. So like I, I can wait a minute. But yeah. it's just like I'm, I'm checking out some shoes that I might want to buy. Like after three seconds, people leave. It's like, I don't want that. So it, okay. it kind of depends on the experience. That might change though, because you see that the, the upcoming like PlayStation 5 and, and whatnot, even believe the Xbox, mm -hmm. will have like super fast uh, loading of games. So maybe in a couple of years, like people just don't want to wait for any games any longer. Maybe it needs to be like start immediately. Uh, so these things might actually change. I mean, I, it goes into the, into this direction that you might say, okay, you, you kick it off with an instant play experience yeah. uh, and then if the user is actually staying on it like like on a mobile um, you know you might have some some um, leisure activities that you just pop it up uh, enjoy your five minutes game on the commute but then if you are getting more serious into it then you actually switch context and maybe load more components um, or t other technologies uh, into into the into your uh, environment to, to get also, a richer also, experience. Yeah, you can like also a teaser, kind of like, people. You like a also, teaser element. Yeah, you can also like cheat people. You know, like the iPhone, like uh, like it has like this like image. So when you launch an app, it just shows an image, and then you fade into yeah. the real app. Or like in the old days when the first iPhone we took a picture, it took like a while to save the picture. So you got this thing that this animation, like, like an old camera, like it's closing the lid. And, and like, okay, people say, oh, that's nice. I got distracted. Yeah, now we saved the image yeah. because it took two seconds. So exactly. you can like do this on a game. Like you go to a website, it will start with some web audio, some, some nice music. There'll come some animations. And while you see that and you get distracted, it's loading the game and then you're ready to play. And no one cares, right? <laughs> Next exactly. Time Compared. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Next time is better based on caching. But I mean, yeah. you're right for for um, line of business applications. I think then web components are clearly a better solution for that because you want to be distraction free. You want to focus on on responsiveness because I mean, see it like this: data entry. You have really professionals that are that are touch typing on the. It needs to be really snap, snap, snap. And I'm still wondering whether you get these kind of Input handling and 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 input processing um, on the on the web UI compared to to full desktop um, uh, UI handling because I mean data entry data pro, uh, you know if you have let's say uh, somebody working at the office and it's really like you know they go through their UI like uh, data entry tap 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 data entry tap and so on and uh, if you have some some really fast and responsive line of business application, I clearly see there, there are huge opportunities in regards with web components. Yeah, actually that's why I, that's the thing I mentioned, like form participation, that kind of, that's a new specification that's implemented in Chrome uh, mm -hmm. and coming to other browsers. That allows you like low level access to how forms work in the web browser. Uh, so just as you have attached shadow, you have something called attached internal, where you get access to validation and whatnot. So you can create like something, especially forms and input that is super fast. And the advantage of using this in the web is that it's built in with the left to right and, and, and validation and it's fast and it's as accessible. So it works whether you're using like a braille system and whatnot. Um, that's also like, if you were to use like in the future Rust uh, and gonna do UI on the web, you're probably gonna mm -hmm. use web components as well. You're just writing them in Rust. 
Uh, All right. Otherwise, we would have to create like a, a big canvas, uh, mm -hmm. and then Rust would have to paint everything on the canvas. Uh, okay. So it's, it's suddenly becoming a whole renderer. And like a renderer that will take care of like doing all the, the event loop and, and scheduling and components, that's going to be big. It's going to be like a Chromium. So you're going to like load a Chromium inside of Chromium. Uh, mm -hmm. Like that's a big part of, a, of an operation system. I used to work on Qt as part of Nokia. And like just yeah. look at Qt, it's pretty big just for the components and whatnot. So like okay. it, I, I'm, uh, I think it's going to be really difficult to like replicate the whole web. You got to replicate everything. You got to replicate the internationalization system. You got to replicate yes. fund rendering. You got to replicate accessibility. Oh my God, like that's going to be a big, big uh, effort. And is I don't see what it will bring you, except this, pain. <laughs> this, this is exactly where this would have been the next keyword that I would like yeah. to pick up when you mentioned Braille um, uh, systems. Uh, what is the, the, the current... Um, uh, situation of web components in regards to um, um, screen readers, in regards to uh, Braille system, text readers, uh, as well as um, ARIA support and accessibility? Well, as it is really HTML and uh, standards, like it works really well with ARIA. Uh, so you can like use that directly on your components. Uh, there is also another upcoming standard called AOM, Accessibility Object Model. Uh, mm -hmm. that uh, provides like a more flexible JavaScript like API, especially think about like, like you might make a web component that's actually a canvas because like you need some very special thing. Uh, maybe you need to show, I don't know, like some medical thing. Uh, and yep. you want to add like uh, accessibility for that. Well, that's going to be custom. So with uh, AOM, you'll be able to actually do that. Like, like area would not serve for that, that purposes. Uh, yep. So, so the, the story actually looks really good. And it's getting every time better and better. It's, it's, it should be the best on the web because it's just based on web tech. Fantastic, Kenneth. Uh, thank you so much. I think if we if we continue to talk, we can fill up hours. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for your time and and, and effort uh, being part of the developers conference here in Mauritius even that it's a virtual event. Uh, I hope that maybe in the future you might have a chance uh, to bring the family as well down to Mauritius, enjoy yes. some nice time at the beaches while spending maybe one, two days at, at our future conference. So with that, thank you so much. Uh, okay. I hope thank that you you're going to enjoy the conference as well, maybe tuning in tomorrow, but I know yeah. your schedule is very busy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have some some time. <laughs> awesome. Take care. Thank you so and much. Enjoy the Thank you very much. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.